There we go. Lock. Lock. All right. All right. I got everything here. Do, 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 do. I even put the date to the, the date already. So you guys ready? Are there any seafarers among us? Ha, a seafar. Welcome. Well, I'm going to get started. Let me begin with a word of prayer. So, ahem. Ahem. Dear Holy Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, I thank you for these students. Just ask that you to, uh, again, just bless our work today. Help us to glorify you and what we do, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, um, let's get right into it. We got a, Today we're talking about rotations. So, <clears throat> or rotational motion, really. So rotational motion is always with respect to some axis, right? So, um, so we, we pick some axis, all right? So let's say, uh, for lack of a better prop, I'll use these, you know? So if this is the axis, right, then around that axis we can talk about a rotation, right? So the rule is this, you take your right hand, you point it in the direction of the axis, and then the way your fingers curl around, that's defined to be the positive direction. So um, we think of that as being quote unquote counterclockwise. All right, so the counterclockwise direction is defined as positive. And so like here's a picture. If we um, talk about this point right here, right? We can talk about the angle theta swept out from the positive x-axis, right? So our, our usual thing, if we want to put coordinates down, we can put the, uh, the axis of rotation at the origin and then we can talk about rotational motion with respect to that, right? And so you guys may or may not know, I think you know, the distance from the origin is r. What, what are these formulas here? What's this and this? By trigonometry we have what? We have <coughs> x equals what? r cosine theta, right? And up here we have y equals to r sine theta. Right? So we can calculate, um, you know, like for example, we can calculate the speed with respect to polar coordinates is one thing we can do. Um, <clears throat> but before I get into that, let me just take a step back here. This theta, we can either talk about it in terms of what? In terms of degrees or what else can we use? You guys remember? Radians, right? So that, that, that's more important for this part of the course than the, the previous because some of the formulas we have really only work for radians. So, um, you know, if we have an arc here like this, right, and it goes, let's say, from theta 1 over here to theta 2, um, we can talk about the, the change in theta here, right? And so if this is along um, an arc of radius, let's say, big, uh, big R, what's the change in arc length up here? The change in S is what? It's R times the change in theta. But this formula assumes what? It assumes we're using radians, right? This is not true for degrees. Um, now, a lot of times, of course, we just write S equals to R theta, right? That's with the understanding that we're talking about the arc length swept out, um, the arc length S swept out as we're sweeping out angle theta 
in, in radians. All right. So, um, all right. Now, let me jump back here to the polar coordinate discussion. What's our formula for speed? What was our formula for speed? We have v is equal to what? Well, I can write it this way. v squared is what? dx squared dx dt squared plus dy dt squared, right? So what is this, how does this work out in terms of polar coordinates? What's the formula for speed in terms of the polar coordinates r and theta? Well, we can derive that, right? So what's the derivative of x? So we have what? We have um, cosine of theta times r dot minus r sine theta times theta dot. We square that. And let's see here, the derivative of y, we have sine theta times r dot plus r cosine theta times theta dot. Now why, why, do, I, why, why do I have two terms? Well, in principle, we're thinking about describing the motion of a point here in the plane, right? We're talking about describing this motion of the point in terms of its polar coordinate r and its polar angle theta. So if you're going to take a second here to close these doors. <clears throat> Welcome to all the CFA people. <laughs> I should have warned you guys, you should sit closer. I've also warned the students, I can't write in 20 size font and write anything interesting. So if you want to see it, you have to sit closer. Of course, you could also bring binoculars if you like, but uh, anyway, so um, this dot notation, what's that mean? What's r dot? r dot is just a shorthand for dr dt, right? So this is notation that has been with physics since the time of Newton. So you square this, what happens? So check it out, you get cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta times r dot squared plus things that cancel out, r squared times sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta times theta dot squared. The terms I haven't written, the cross terms, you get a plus two on the one side, you get a minus two on the other, and they all cancel out. This is what you're left with. Of course, you guys know sine squared plus cosine squared is one, so what do we get? We get r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared. So this is the formula for speed in terms of polar coordinates, all right? Now, we have other notation for this. What we're looking at here is um, the tangential, well, excuse me, the radial velocity squared plus the tangential velocity squared. Let me try to draw a picture to explain that more. So if you're thinking about, you know, the motion along this point right here, right? The velocity we can decompose into two pieces. So if this is the velocity, it's got two pieces. The one piece, let me make that bigger. Sorry, I've made the part that you guys don't care about super huge and the part that we're interested in super small. Let me choose a different path here. So, <clears throat> so here's the place we're talking about. Here's the velocity vector. All right, the origin's over here somewhere, let's say. So here's the distance from the origin we call r. So the velocity has two pieces, all right? And the two pieces are the radial piece, which corresponds to the, the radius increasing, like this piece here. So this is, the length of this is vt, right? And then the other piece corresponds to how you're sweeping around the axis. And so that piece is right here, and that's called um, the t for tangential. Now the tangential has to do with how we're sweeping out this arc, right? So here is the direct, so like theta is increasing in this direction, all right? Now there's, there's more I can say, what, what, what's the deal here? This tangential piece, what is it? It's equal to, it's equal to ds um, dt. Well, that's not always true. That's true. <clears throat> I should be careful. 
That's only true if what? My bad. This is only true if we're going in a circular arc, but at the moment I'm not assuming we're going in a circular arc. Um, so the, the formula, oh man, well, one of these has got to change, right? <laughs> I wrote something I didn't mean. What I mean, what I mean to put here? That's supposed to be R for radial. So the radial piece, the formula for it is just the R dot squared, R, R dot. And the tangential piece, the formula is R theta dot. All right. Um, some special cases. What, what, is it, what, what, what would it mean to have circular motion? That would be what? We would have r dot equals to zero, right? So in the case of circular motion, what's the formula for speed become? We just get what? V equals two? Do 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 here. Um, just VR, right? My bad. The other way around. VT, which is, in this case, r theta dot. All right. Let's see here. So I, I should tell you a little bit more about circular motion, right? So here we go. So for circular motion, we have that, right? Now, <clears throat> this is actually not just for circular motion, but we have a definition theta dot is equal to omega. This is the angular velocity. All right. And what else? Uh, what's the second derivative of the angle? Theta double dot. So this is what's called alpha. This is the angular acceleration. All right. So Right, if, I, if I stay in the context of circular motion, can you tell me how, how is the arc length swept around the circle and related, to the, um, related to the radius? Well, we just have the formula what? S is equal to what? R times theta, right? So what, what happens when we differentiate this once? We get what? We get S dot is equal to r theta dot, right? So here I'm talking about r equals to r, so it's, it's constant, constant radius. So this would be a special case of what I have on the left-hand side, okay? Now, what happens, so what is that in terms of, um, so what this is, is that the, the speed, v, is equal to r omega. All right. So for circular motion, the tangential speed is equal to the radius times the angular speed. All right. And if we take the second derivative here, s double dot, well, that's r theta double dot, which is what? So that gives us the, now, now my question is, does that give us the acceleration? Um, you can tell from the inflection of my voice that it's not true, right? What does that give us? It doesn't give us the acceleration magnitude, does it? Remember, we, we worked this out before in this course. So what did we work out for circular motion? What's the deal with acceleration? The acceleration has two pieces, right? Remember? We have um, the centripetal part, right? V squared over R in the direction of, you know, um, let's say minus R hat. And then we had plus, um, the uh, tangential component of the acceleration in the tangential direction. This is what we learned before, right? So my question is, and if you remember, when we worked this out, we found that the tangential acceleration was S double dot. It was actually the change in speed with respect to time. So what this actually tells you is that the tangential component of the acceleration is equal to R alpha, all right? The magnitude of the acceleration has another piece. It has that centripetal piece, okay? 
Okay, so but these, these, these formulas are important. We'll see we need to use these to solve word problems here before long. Um, so my next question for you would be, suppose that we do have um, motion along a circle, right? What's the formula for the acceleration in terms of, let's say, omega and alpha? We had a problem like that before, but here's a, uh, now we're working with a slightly different set of parameters here. So in terms of omega and alpha, what is the formula for the magnitude of the acceleration? So let's work it out. So remember, we, we, we have that the magnitude of the acceleration, right? It's the square root of the centripetal piece squared plus the tangential piece squared, right? But um, the centripetal piece, AC is equal to what? AC is V squared over R. We could write that in terms of omega. What would it be? We have what, r omega quantity squared divided by r, right? So this gives us <clears throat> r omega squared. So the, the formula for the centripetal acceleration in terms of the angular velocity is just r omega squared. So this we have r omega squared for ac squared. Well, r omega squared squared, which gives us what, r squared omega to the fourth power, right? Plus what? plus the tangential acceleration squared. But the tangential acceleration, mind you, is just r alpha, right? So we have plus r squared alpha squared. So if we want to find the acceleration for a particle in circular motion in terms of the angular velocity and acceleration, that's what we have to use. All right. <clears throat> Many problems we face, we have um, a constant angular acceleration, right? So you guys remember at the start of the course we talked about constant acceleration problems? Well, now we can talk about constant angular acceleration problems. So how's that go? Well, let me uh, erase this offensive. Uh... Actually, I'll do it over here. <clears throat> alpha, so let's say alpha equals to alpha naught, where that's just a, a constant angular acceleration. So we start with, we have alpha naught equal to, what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to d omega dt, right? Because that's equal to alpha. The angular acceleration is the time rate of change of the angular velocity. So then what do you do? Integrate, what do we get? We get omega f equals to omega naught plus alpha naught times t, right? So here I'm, I'm looking at time zero being the base of our analysis, right? So this is omega sub zero is the um, angular velocity at time zero, all right? And then, well, this is equal to uh, d theta dt, right? So we integrate again, and what does that give us? That gives us that the final angle is equal to the initial angle, plus integrating the above omega naught t, plus integrating the above one half alpha naught t squared. So these formulas should be very familiar, right? It's just like we had before, but now instead of having velocity, we have angular velocity. Instead of it having position, now we have angle. So think of angle as being the rotational distance, right? What other formulas did we have that we used for solving problems in kinematics? Do you guys remember? Remember our, one of our favorite, what was that? The timeless equation, right? So. We also have a timeless equation here. You can derive essentially by the same rules that omega f squared is equal to omega naught squared plus two alpha naught times the um, change in angle, right? So we also have the timeless equation. There's also an analog to the, like, the average angular velocity being the average of the angular velocities equation. That's, that's still with us as well. So, let me see here. I think I have a problem to show you guys. Give me a second here while I locate things. Any questions while I'm doing this? Am 
Let's see here. So we are currently in lecture 25. Last time, which, which one did we do? We didn't do 24, did we? What did we do? <laughs> we did lecture like, I forget what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a bit ahead. It was the one on, um, you know, cross products, right? We will get back to cross products before you know it, but not today. Um, well, come on. <laughs> it won't let me open it the way I want. It's annoying. Let's see here. Oh, come on. My fingers would work. There we go. Come on. You can do it. There we go. So we're in lecture 25 here. I have a bunch of uh, more conceptual comments at the start of that that I'd encourage you to read. Um, so again, you know, definition of angular acceleration is that. Where's my, gotta find my laser. Oh, here it is. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. There's a derivation that I went through. Um, this is kind of fun. Another way you could derive what we worked out today, which is, I think, amusing. Um, sorry, I will eventually find the full screen mode. For some reason, it disappears when I'm looking for it up here. Um, but if you look here, Another way you could derive the formula, and I think these kinds of arguments are fun, is if you want to, you could look at, well, it's kind of bright, isn't it? Um, going from A to B, you can think about the arc length that's subtended. You can break it into two pieces, right? You've got the radial piece and then the, the circular piece, right? So the circular piece is rd theta. The radial piece is dr. ds squared, right, is the radial piece squared plus the angular piece squared. If you think about it, if you're small enough in, it's not really curved. It's essentially a line, right? And then you just divide by dt squared, and you derive what I derived with calculus over there. So this is a sort of intuitive geometric way of understanding that the speed squared has two pieces. It has the radial piece, and it has the angular piece, right? So again, you know, when do we use this formula? Well, we use this formula when we're dealing with rotational motion where the radius is changing. A lot of problems we work don't have the radius changing, so we don't have to use that. But if we do, we do. All right, so <clears throat> I just went through all that. Here's an example. <clears throat> example one. We have a car going around a circle. We've talked about this kind of thing before, right? And um, it's turning around a, a, an arc with radius 30 meters. I say our speed is increasing at one meter per second squared. What's the maximum speed we can reach without losing traction? We worked this problem before, right? But without the concept of angular acceleration, right? We just looked at it in terms of the tangential and the, and the centripetal. But now we can look at it in, in a new light. So the Newton's law still applies. The mass times, the, you know, mass times acceleration, force of gravity, the normal force, and the force of friction. The force of friction is what allows us to keep going in a circle, right? So if we look at the magnitude of Newton's second law, we just get the force of friction, which is mu s mg, is equal to the magnitude of the acceleration. However, in this context, the acceleration has two pieces, right? It has the radial piece and it has the tangential piece. And so we find a reason now to use the formula that I, I, I think I have right there. By the way, you notice that we could factor what out here. Do you see a simplification here? We could factor r out of this, right? r times the square root of r, oh, there's no r there, right? r times omega to the fourth plus alpha squared. Because I have a common r squared both places, right? Pull it out like that. Uh-oh. Yeah, I had it on the board. I just brought it over to 
Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> well, <laughs> good. So, um, sorry, I there were there was there was a, a, a happening with the camera early this semester that's got me like on edge. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, sorry. Um, <clears throat> Because I know we have a few people missing and I want to make sure they can see what we did. Anyway, so the acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration, right, is equal to mu s times g because we can divide by m. And then I just have to put in the, what, we're, what we're given, right? So I gave us that the tangential acceleration was one meter per second squared, right? Its, its speed was increasing at one meter per second squared. The increase in the speed is the tangential acceleration, all right? And on the other hand, it's going around a circle, so you're stuck with the centripetal acceleration as described by, um, let's see here, this piece right here. Well, no. Oh, we're trying to figure that out, right? So um, we don't know the V. So th this balancing is, th w this balancing is when you're, so what, what do we have here? The reason this gives you the maximum speed is because that's the maximum possible force of friction, right? So we're maxing out the speed that we can go around the turn. And anyway running through the equation here, putting in what we have, we get 15.28 meters per second. So the basic idea, though, is that when we're dealing with circular motion, we have to account for two things, right? We have to account for some force to keep it going in a circle, right? And we have to have another part of the force to account for increase in radial, excuse me, in tangential speed if there is one. Both of these things have to be accounted for to describe circular motion. All right. My next example, well, I told you about these equations, right? These are the constant acceleration equations. Here's, a, here's an example with constant acceleration. You have a car accelerates from rest to 40 meters per second using wheels with a 40 centimeter di diameter. If the linear acceleration was constant and took five seconds, then find the angular velocity and acceleration of the wheels. Also, how many revolutions do the wheels make? So one of the What's the relation between the linear velocity and the angular velocity? So the, this is the rolling without slipping idea. So this right here, s equals to r theta, is another way of saying rolling without slipping. This says that the arc length that you roll out while your wheel goes through angle theta is the radius of the wheel times the angle which you go through. So like, for example, if I have a, you know, if I have a wheel which has a circumference of three feet and I go through 10 revolutions, how many feet do I go? I go 30 feet, right? Because the circumference times the number of revolutions should give me the distance that the wheel travels if it's rolling without slipping. Um, the equation for that, <clears throat> so the, the, this right here says that the, the linear speed is equal to the angular speed times the radius is what that says. And um, now the other thing to watch out for here is, look at this, this is very sneaky. I gave us, see that? Diameter. Watch out for that in these word problems. They like to do this. They give you the diameter when you need the what? The rate. All the formulas are for radius, right? So, um, it's what do you say is dumb. Yeah, it is kind of dumb, but physicists are like that. I didn't write the book. They did it. It's all, it's all their fault. I take no responsibility for this. Anyway, um, anyway, so the in initial angular speed was zero. The um, let's see here. I have to get away from this for a second. So we're, we're going 40 meters per second at the end, right? So 40 meters per second divided by the radius, that gives me the, angular, the final angular speed, which is 200 radians per second here. And then I can calculate the angular, accel angular acceleration by taking the final angular velocity minus the initial angular velocity divided by time, right? Just like we did with acceleration. Vf minus V0 divided by time gives me acceleration, right? Same for omega. And I get 40 radians per second squared. Then um, omega is alpha times t here because omega not zero, right? And uh, what's the theta as a function of time? Well, I've, I've got the, my alphas. Why, why do I have 20, not 40? What's this? One, right, one half alpha, right? We have to do one half the ex angular acceleration here. And so I get 500 radians. How many radians course, how many revolutions do you have? To change radians to revolutions, you multiply by a revolution every two pi radians, right? Every two pi radians is one revolution, which is also known as 
360 degrees, right? So we've got these three competing descriptions of angle. Revolutions, radians, degrees. You have to deal with it, right? We, we talk about all three. Um, so There are others. So finally, <clears throat> as we're going on here, we're going to be, everything we've done for the linear case, right? There's a corresponding rotational analog, right? There's like rotational kinetic energy. Um, well, there is no rotational gravitational potential energy. There's not an analog for everything, but the, the, the kinematics part there is. So if you want to understand the kinetic energy due to a system of particles, right? And so this system of particles we have to imagine they're all, they're all rotating around a central axis, right? So imagine that, you know, you've got this axis, right? And you've got particles that are stuck somewhere out here. So like here, the, maybe imagine the cap of this marker being the particle, right? As the axis rotates, that particle is stuck in rotation around the axis at that same place. So like the, the, the masses are not free to go any which way. They have to be maintaining their distance from the rotational axis. They're rotating rigidly around this axis. So I think I have a picture if I scroll down a bit. Yeah, here. So you're imagining the system of, so like a Christmas tree, right? But it's really rigid and you've got these, you know, I don't know, billiard balls stuck at particular distances from the center of the tree and you're rotating it, right? What's the kinetic energy of such a system? So here we're assuming that the axis has no mass and that the things that are holding the mass in place, whatever these are holding these masses in place, th those have negligible mass. All of the kinetic energy is coming from these, these point masses, okay? So to calculate the kinetic energy, you would do, just you add the kinetic energy of each of the masses. One half m sub j v sub j squared, right? But, <clears throat> Since the motion is purely rotational, we can describe the velocity just by r omega for each mass. So the radius that the mass is at times omega, notice that omega is shared by everything. They're all rotating at the same speed. Same angular velocity for everything here. So that's shared. And <clears throat> so you can factor out the omega squared and you get this formula. Now, this right here is, what this is, is the rotational analog of mass. It describes, in some sense, the resistance of the system to be rotated, just like mass describes the resistance of, you know, material objects to be accelerated, right? In the same sense. And so that's the, called the moment of inertia for this system of point masses. And what we find is that the kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. All right. So if you have a system of just masses and they're rotating around some axis, this is the formula for um, the moment of inertia, you just add the square, the mass times the distance from the axis squared, you add them up. A simple example of this, example three here, is if I want to talk about what's the kinetic energy of like a barbell, that's length L, and you've got two, you know, two masses at the end and you're spinning it around its central axis, what's the kinetic energy of that in terms of the angular velocity? So what you do is you calculate the moment of inertia in this case, it's the length, the distance from the axis of rotation is L over 2. So I do M1 L over 2 squared plus M2 L over 2 squared. And, um, and I said that the uh, mass 1 and mass 2 were both equal to M, right? So that gives me 1 half ML squared. So that tells me the kinetic energy of this barbell in terms of the angular velocity is just ML squared omega squared over 4, right? And then you could contrast that. Like what's the angular, what's the uh, rotational kinetic energy um, of a barbell where it's, it's off center, right? Like what if you have one of the barbells closer and one of them farther out? You know, how, how would that go? And so this time I have 2L over 3, so it's the same bar, right? Still the same length L. I'm just rotating around the, the third waypoint rather than the halfway point, right? Um, so what do, you, what do you think? For the same angular, um, for the same angular speed, which one is going to have more kinetic energy? <laughs> oh man, you can still see my hands. Curses. Well, the answer is on the board, but um, <clears throat> so what is it? Which, well, I guess my question is, which is bigger, one quarter or five eighteenths? Five eighteenths is bigger. So this has more kinetic energy 
than that. What do you think, where, what point should we rotate at, oh, um, w w around which point should we rotate in order to give the barbell maximum kinetic energy? What's that? The end, I think you're right, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you could do that, right? But um, otherwise, like, I guess the point which the barbell stops being in the way. <clears throat> anyway, that's a start for today. So next time, we'll be looking at how to calculate the moment of inertia for more, um, more complicated shapes, right? Because if you think about this, you can think about something else rotating, right? Like I could think about, oh, I don't know, for lack of imagination, this, right? I could take this and I could rotate this around an axis, right? Like that. And then I can ask, what's the rotational kinetic energy of this if I could hold it st steady, right? And so I can ask, what is the moment of inertia of this bag? So to figure that out, I have to think of the bag as a bunch of masses, right? And I have to calculate the moment of inertia for each point in the bag, and then I have to add it up to get the moment of inertia for the bag as a whole. What is that? How do you do that kind of thing? How do you take a sum over infinitely many masses? What is that? That's, that's an integral, right? So next time we'll have to look at certain integrals to calculate the moment of inertia for, you know, interesting things like a bowling ball. What's the moment of inertia for a bowling ball? What's the moment of inertia for a can? What's the moment of inertia for different shapes? And we'll look at that next time. So that's lecture 26. Anyway, so that's <clears throat> it for the lecture part today. For what time remains, I've got a quiz for you guys. So, so as, you, as you guys may have noticed, I forgot to put a special relativity question on your test too. My, I'm so sorry about that. But to make up for it, I'm giving you this bonus quiz. Woohoo!